Great. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Leah Smalley. I'm the Assistant Director of Financial Aid Services at the Coordinating Board. Thank you so much for joining me today. We actually have two special guests on the webcast today, and so I'm actually going to be having them present, and I will also be doing a little bit of information towards the end of my webcast. But if you've joined over the past two months, I did <laughs> announce that um, we will be having different presenters that will be coming onto the webcast in the future months. So this is one of those initiatives to get those people familiar um, from my team and also from other areas of our agency. So I'm going to kick it off today and go ahead and go through the topics of discussion. So bear with me and we'll get started. All right. So here we go. I think there is a delay. There it goes. All right. So our topics of discussion for today, we will be going through the 2021 program guidelines. There has been various updates on those, and so Sophia is going to present those. We're also going to be doing a live uh, demo through the PowerPoint on the new work study mentorship reporting portal. So Vanessa Malo is going to be joining us for that piece of our presentation. And lastly, we're going to be going through updates, training, and deadline reminders, which I'll be going through with at, um, towards the end of the presentation. Um, and then, like I mentioned, as we go through each of the topics, if you come across questions you want to ask, please use the chat feature and go ahead and type those in. Where I do have Deshay Reed on, and she's going to be fielding some of those questions, and then I will be addressing those as well. So I'm going to turn it over to Sophia, and she's going to be going through the program guideline updates. Sophia? Okay, Sophia, if you can hear me, they cannot hear you. Okay, just give us just a minute. We're going to, it may have had something to do with the PowerPoint, so I apologize. Give us just a second. Sophia, can you hear? I can hear. So there you are. Me. Ah, Sorry, there we I go. Was muted. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. Um, time to mute me. Okay. Uh, yes, I will be discussing the 21-22 program guidelines update. As you all know, we have um, every year we update our program guidelines. Um, sorry, every year we update our program guidelines, and this year we published them in two different sets. We first released uh, the College Access Loan Program ta TASP and the Educational Aid Program guidelines. They were released on April 29th. And just last week on Thursday, we released Texas Grant, TOG, TEG, and Texas College Work Study Programs, Texas College Work Study and Work Study Mentorship. Um, all the program guidelines are available now on our webpage under Program Resources. And so what I will be going over are the changes. Annually, we'll update the program years, program award amounts. So you'll start seeing the new award amounts throughout the program guidelines. We will update the, any deadlines that may have changed and priority EFC as they affect different programs. We also uh, want to make changes that help the administration of the program. So this year we made some enhancements to the program guidelines. You'll see that we re release the links to the TAC and TEC code, or actually just the TAC code as on the section headers through the relevant um, code. So you'll see that all there. You'll also see that we have now published a archive copy of the rules and guide, the rules and statute that were used to create these guidelines. So this is new and that's because when we took the links out last year because rules periodically change and so the links were becoming outdated. 
So in this case, what we wanted to do is link the guidelines, and if for any reason the rule changed, then you can refer back to Appendix 2, and you can find a archived copy of the rules in the appendix that were used to create the guidelines. We also added the frequently asked questions that you previously would find in our webpage. So what will happen is that webpage is going away, and previous, uh, frequently asked questions are going to be available on each of the publications of the guidelines annually. So it'll be nice to see them updated on an annual basis, make sure they stay up to date. Another thing that we do annually is evaluate the rules to see what change and what impacts um, the administration of programs for the upcoming year. Now, there were quite a bit of changes in Chapter 22, quite a bit. Um, wording changes, rule changes, they moved, but they didn't really impact the administration of the program. The following changes did impact the administration of the program. So the removal of proration requirement in all the grant programs the removal of over-award and award adjustment criteria as it applies to Texas College Work Study, and the addition of the authority to transfer as it applies to work study programs between themselves, Texas College Work Study and Work Study Mentorship. So as you go through, in November 2020, the provisions pertaining to proration requirements were removed for TOG, Texas Grant, and TEG, and this change was, to, was made to provide institutions with the flexibility to address the needs of their student population and eliminate unnecessary level of complexity in the administration of the program. So, for example, with TEOG, institutions no longer have to prorate any of the awards for students enrolled less than 12 hours as of census date. So, starting next year, a student who is enrolled less than 12 hours can still receive a full award. In addition, they don't have, an institution won't have to uh, prorate as for a student enrolled less than six hours due to hardship. They still have to be enrolled in least than six hours and still have to meet the criteria necessary to receive an award, but they do not have to be enrolled, they do not have to prorate the award if they receive a hardship. And then also, if a student is, has a balance remaining of less than 12 hours, from attempted hours or program eligible hours, and they are enrolled in 12 hours, but they have less hours remaining, again, you do not have to prorate that award. So a student who has three hours of eligibility remaining and who is enrolled in 12 hours, if the institution wants to, they can make a full award to that student, even though there's only three hours of eligibility remaining, as an example. With Texas Grant, uh, institutions also no longer have to prorate and this would be for students enrolled less than nine hours due to hardship. Again, the student will still have to be enrolled at least in six hours because the student who's not enrolled in least in six hours is not eligible for Texas grant. But if they are enrolled less than six, uh, nine hours due to hardship, then they are still eligible and they would they are eligible for a full award or the target award amount. And if they have a balance less than nine hours remaining or a balance of less than nine hours eligible program hours remaining, the student can still be issued a full award or this institution can choose to prorate if they choose to do so. The TEG proration was removed and so institutions no longer have to prorate anyone who's enrolled less than three quarter time. And so that's, that'll definitely take a headache away from TEG <laughs> because they're an annual award. All right. Other changes that were made to the administrative code that affected the program's administration is the award adjustments and over awards were removed from Texas College Work Study. This was done because the wording in that section was now only pertains to Texas uh, to grant programs. So the language was updated to only pertain to grant programs. It's unlikely um, that a work study program would ever really make an award adjustment since the student is earning the hours. So you'll see in the guidelines that this section was removed. In November 2020, um, again, the TAC codes were changed and the authority to transfer was updated for Texas College work study programs. 
So this change is, happened in November. All the changes that we're discussing actually happened in November. And so for this, in this case, institutions can now participate and um, transfer funds from Texas College Work Study to Work Study Student Mentorship. And they can transfer up to 25% between the two programs. The 25% is based on the allocated amount from the program that it's transferring from. Okay, so because this change happened in November, institutions can actually take advantage of this transfer now. To request a transfer form, you would have to submit a contact us by July 2021 if you're oh, doing this it for pointless. this year and 2022 for next year. Um, if you do want to have a uh, one to participate and you want to transfer funds between these programs, you will have to submit the contact us and the TTCB staff will respond and provide you the next steps. I'll now hand it over to Vanessa Malo, who is going to discuss the work study mentorship program, the new reporting process. Good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be able to um, spend some time with you here virtually. Um, I'm very excited to announce that we have a new online report portal, and I just wanted to take an opportunity to show how to navigate through the portal. And just please permit some time in between slides. It takes a little bit um, of time to transition to the next slide. There we go. Success. Well, we may have gone a little too far. One moment. Almost there. This is what you call a backwards by design presentation. Just kidding. Okay, we are almost there. Okay, so we'll begin by how do we gain access to this new portal? So many of you already have access to the CB Pass software system, so you probably already have accounts. I'll talk about what to do if you do not have an account with the CB Pass system, and the CB Pass system is essentially where this portal was built in. So that's where it is housed and that's where it functions. So if you already have an account, I apologize for trying to show you the picture that shows what to do if you um, already have an account, but we'll go ahead and proceed forward here. So if you already have an account, you'll log into the CB Pass account, you'll click the My Access tab, then you'll click Request Access to Another Application, and then there will be a drop-down box where you'll select the work study mentorship program and then you will simply click request access once you do that you'll receive a notification um, well you actually won't receive a notification right away what will occur is on the back end on the administrative side i will receive the notification and if you have already completed the account holder form that was provided on the may 3rd notification that i sent out that is the contact information I'm going to refer to. So I'll look at that information and say, okay, this particular college, this is the account holder, I approve. Um, and then you will then have access to begin utilizing the portal. Now, if you do not have a CB Pass account, you will follow the little photo that's here. Um, You'll click on CB Pass login page. It'll bring you to a main page with literally exactly what you see. 
underneath username and password, you'll notice that it says create one now. You'll click on that. And when you click on that, it'll have a series of steps, just like anything that you register for, you have to provide security questions and profile information. Once you complete that step, then you'll be able to request a program you're trying to access and essentially go through the same steps that you would have gone if you had had an account. I receive the information, I review who your account holder is for your institution, and I click approve. And then at that point, whichever direction you go, you'll be able to now use the, the actual portal. And one of the things before I proceed forward I want to mention is everything I'm going over with you today is located in the portal instructions which were attached in the May 3rd communication, but they are also located within the homepage of this portal and on the um, work study mentorship webpage. So if you're ready to submit a report, and we have an upcoming report date of June 5th where you're going to be submitting financial reports. You'll arrive to this homepage and you'll see a descriptor about your program. You will see um, in the gray box, which is surrounded by red, you'll see portal instructions, which you can click on. It'll populate that document for you to look at. If you want to send me an email because you have a question, you can click on the, the blue turquoise button that says send email. Or perhaps you want to see the guidelines, allocation amounts, or just content about the program, you'll click on the WSME webpage button. Below this particular photo, there's additional information. So you want to make sure that on every screen you scroll down to see everything. I do this often. I don't scroll down on this important information. When you go below these two boxes that you see here, you're going to see a table with reporting details and dates. And then just key points that you want to keep in, more, in mind as you're submitting your reports. So now that you have a, a good understanding of how it functions, it's time to begin. There we go. So now the first step, I want to submit a report. What do I do? So to submit a report, you click on the Work Summary tab on the blue bar at the very top of the screen. And when you click on that, it's going to pull up what you see here in the, in the photo. And there are four major buttons here that are in blue on the very bottom. I'm going to read them to you because it's probably hard for you to see from where you're at. So the first button that's circled in red here says Create FSR Term 1. That's the Financial Summary Report. The second is Create a Program Summary Report. The third button is Create a Program Outcome Report. And the fourth button is create a financial summary report for term two. Now each report is distinct and is connected to a specific period of time. For instance, the FSR term one report, which is the financial summary report, is what's due this coming June. And that covers your expenses from September through May. Fast forward to September 5th, you're now reporting an overview of your program, that's a program summary report, very much in alignment with the templates you've already been using for the last couple of years, especially the 1921. And then you're also going to create a program outcome report. So that tells us, you know, how are the students progressing academically? Did they persist? Did they graduate? Did they enroll into a post-secondary institution? Um, what types of activities did you implement? How many students did you serve? So it tells the story of the program. And then the last report is um, the financial report, which covers everything now from September all the way through August. So it encompasses your August, I'm sorry, your summer period of expenses. It's very important to remember that all of these reports are required uh, no matter the circumstance, you always wanna um, submit them. If you take a look at the grid that's above these buttons, if I had pressed create FSR term one and I, I completed the report, which I'm gonna show you what that looks like in a moment, and I press submit, it's gonna populate here. So what you'll see is it'll show the year, the program year, it'll show what term, so is it, are we in the September through May period? It'll say what kind of report it is, it'll say if it's been drafted, 
if it's been submitted, if it's been declined, and we'll talk about that, and it'll show the date. So this is literally a working page for you. You also have the option of click clicking report details. That allows you to see the report, what it looks like after you've submitted it. So at that point, you could save it to your desktop if you wanted to. Um, you could review it, um, all those things. We're gonna move to the, the next stage here. Here we go, okay. So if I had clicked on the Create FSR Report, which is the Financial Summary Report for Term 1, June, June 5th, this is the screen that would populate. You'll notice that it has fields with aggregate numbers. This is a little bit different from your um, financial report templates that you've been using because those reports you were submitting on a monthly basis, right? And then it had the final totals and it was the final totals that we would submit to the financial aid database system. In this case, what we've done is it is the final totals only and also your available balances. For instance, you always wanna include how much, um, how, many, how much funds you have available from the, from the prior year, so what's your balance, because that can be carried forward into the new year as long as it's expended within the binium received. Then you wanna put your allocation for this year, so how much did you receive for the current year. If you return funds, you wanna take a look at that because that could impact how much you have available to work with for this year. If you transferred money, you want to put what that amount is because that could also impact your total. I will tell you that because you are returning funds when you do a transfer, that you really just need to submit one or the other fields. So you don't need to submit both. That way you can get an accurate total. So this total available funds is going to show you, based on what you submitted, what you have to work with for the year and how much you have left so that you can plan appropriately. The other field that you'll be submitting is your total to date um, students that you employed. So this would be for the June 5th report, would be how many students did you employ from September all the way through May? How, how, uh, what is the total earned student wages for September through May? If you are required to submit a match, you would put that in here as well. And then it's gonna calculate what your final totals are, just like you have on your report. Now you can't see all of the um, report. I think we have another slide here that might show you another part of it. Um, but essentially, as you scroll down this screen, you'll see the same concept, an affirming statement, review, and um, submit of the report. There's also a comment box, which you see here now. There's an alert. If you're eligible for the waiver letter, it'll tell you about it, how you, you know, what you need to know as far as eligibility goes. This particular document from now on will be uploaded through an upload screen and tab that's here that I'll talk about. And then you will sign and submit. Now you'll notice that the submit term one button is grayed out. It's grayed out because unless you submit content into the fields, it will not allow you to press submit. You have to finish it, right? Now you'll also notice that there's a print button and there's a save button. If you're not ready to submit the document or this particular report, you can actually complete it. You can press save and then you can come back to it later. And the screen that I showed you, which was the work summary screen, it's gonna show status draft. And then when you're ready to go back to work on it, you can. So that means if you were to gain access to the portal today, you could technically go in there. You could complete a few of the fields, press save, step away from it and come back. Now, I will suggest that every 15 minutes, if you're still working on this particular um, report, that you save because it is possible that the system will log out and I do not want you to lose all of your work. And while we wait to go to the next screen, I'll share with you that in the email notification and also in the guidelines that was provided recently, we went ahead and included templates which replicate these screens. You're welcome to use those templates now as a resource. They're not required to be submitted to me. They are not required to be uploaded into the Move It system any longer. Everything's going into the portal, but if you wanna use those templates as a, a form of drafting, 
in preparation for your reporting period, you're more than welcome to do that. And you can adjust them as you see fit. So now that we've gone over the financial report, we've progressed to September 5th, and it's time to submit your program outcome. This is a screenshot of what that screen looks like. Um, again, same fields that you've been working with in the Excel spreadsheets templates that I've been providing to you. You know, in this particular one, it has secondary outcomes that is talking about how many students were served. Of those students that were served, how many persisted from their first year to their sophomore year, how many graduated, um, the activity types, and, um, and also you'll always be provided with a comment box if you want to add additional information. And the same concept, you review, you can save it, you can print it, or you can submit it. This, this report will also appear in the work summary page. So now we are at the program summary. So this particular, um, this particular report is going to tell us how your program structured, an overview, the types of positions that you implemented, whether the students were tutors, mentors, or advisors, or, or, or all three, how many students did you serve, and the types of activities. Again, it's the same concept as you, you have to scroll down through the screen. Um, you all you have a comment box and you also have the opportunity to, to save, print, and submit. So here we get to the next phase, which is I've submitted my reports and I have to think about, okay, what are some additional uh, components to my program? Am I exempt from the required match for the program? If I am, then I need to provide a coordinating board with a Title III letter from the U.S. Department of Education, and so there is a dedicated upload screen in the portal. So you'll go to the Upload tab, and there are three sections where you can upload things. One is dedicated to the eligibility letter, so it'll tell you what it's about and what to do. The second is if you have an off-campus program where you're serving high school students, either in a nonprofit setting or a high school setting within a school district, you're required to have an MOU, so you'll upload that MOU. And then if there's additional documents or accomplishments that you want to share with us, um, there's a, a, a third opportunity to upload those documents. The way that that works, and I apologize that I don't have a pointer. Um, I might be able to get it to work really quickly here. It wasn't working earlier. If you give me one second, Let's see if that's helpful. Okay, we have a pointer. It is moving a little slow, but we've made it. Okay. <laughs> so what you'll do is you go to the Upload tab here. You'll click on it. This screen will populate. And then if you want to upload something, you'll go to the next section here, um, squared in red. You'll click Browse. The Browse function allows you to pick the file that you desire to upload. So it will appear here, right? You'll click on it. It'll say Insert, click Insert. And then you'll go to Upload. Upload makes it official. It uploads it to the actual screen itself, and you'll see that in this grid that's right here below that I'm pointing at. Now, at this point, you have a couple of options. If you accidentally uploaded your resume and not the eligibility letter, you can delete it. And you can go back and go through the same step and upload the correct document. Um, if you want to view what you uploaded first, just to make sure it's correct, you can click download and you can view the um, document you uploaded first. Once you've reviewed everything and you feel good about it, then you can go down to the bottom of the screen. And in the middle of that screen, on the very bottom, it says a big button that says submit. You press submit. At that point, your uploads disappear, but they go into the database system so that the coordinating board receives your documents. The work summary screen that I showed you originally will populate that submission for you. So the same concept, you can go back, review the details, and see what you've submitted for the year and kind of keep track of everything. That's also helpful because over time, if you have any transitions, different project leads that that come on board, if they need to see the history or just jump right into the program, they can go back and look at all of that information. Okay, we are almost to the end here. So this is, you've, you've concluded your year, you've submitted all of your reports, and 
you have someone new to your team or you want to see what you've submitted for the year, we have a dedicated program history tab. And so this is available to view previously submitted reports or uploaded documents by year. So if you look here at the um, report history tab, it has two options, report history or upload history. So it's kept separately. If I want to see my report history, I click on report history. Then I go to this section here where it says year. Now I can click on all because after a couple of years, you're going to have quite a collection in here. Or I can click on a specific year and then go to run. And when that happens, I have now the ability to see everything that I've submitted. Um, I can print it. I can save it to my desktop or a file. Um, but it allows accessibility, right, to, to what you've accomplished for the year. Um, and you will be able to see this over time. Okay, let me go back just one second. There's one thing I want to show you. Well, actually, I'll just stop right here. Two things very quickly. When we are handling the financial report, when you submit your report and you've submitted to the financial aid database system, there's a period of time that we go through reconciliation and resolving any kind of discrepancy. When that occurs there, depending on the circumstance, you may need to update your report based on a review of, of accounting, correct? And so um, rather than doing that manually, what you will do is we'll have a conversation. You'll let me know. We'll review it. Then what I will do is actually decline that report, which will allow you to go to the work summary screen to which you can click on the report details and everything that you originally drafted will populate. But the difference is that there's gonna be a reconciliation button at the bottom. So it'll allow you to edit only the fields that need to be revised or updated. Then you'll click resubmit and we'll go through the same process. That's how we will resolve that. Now, if it's a rounding issue, we know how to take care of that. But if it's a, a number difference or that kind of thing, you do have to update your report and that's how that's handled. The last thing is this, this is a new portal. This is the first time we're gonna be using it for this year. So we are going to live and learn together. I appreciate any feedback or anything that you can share with me over time. Um, there's always opportunity for growth and there's also opportunity to improve the system. So please don't hesitate to let me know. Thank you very much for your time. I'm gonna pass it over to Leah. Thank you, Vanessa, and thank you, Sophia. Um, both of y'all provided excellent information for the institutions. Um, hopefully, y'all are getting a lot of good uh, tidbits on not only the program guidelines, but the new work-study mentorship portal. Um, like both of them said, um, there's resources out there available to help you through these processes. So please don't exclusively rely on this webcast. Um, the webcast is to try and work through some of the questions you may have, but for sure, if you need to set up time with the coordinating board to talk through anything, we're, we're happy to do that for you. But um, before I move on to the updates, trainings, and deadlines information, I did have one question that came through, Vanessa, for you that I didn't want to answer on your behalf. It says, from Stephanie Martin, if we have multiple high schools that we work with, do we need to upload all MOUs? Um, they're exactly the same except for the name of the school district. So I wanted to let you answer that before I move forward. Thank you, that's a great question, Stephanie. If it is different school districts and different MOUs, you will wanna upload each MOU. Okay, and if it's the same district, but different high schools and they have uh, multiple MOUs, same thing regardless? Um, it depends how you structure. If you have an MOU for one school district, but it, in the MOU, it has listed all the different schools within that district that you're serving, then in that case, you would just submit that one MOU. It's okay. More... She... Go ahead. she clarified it's all different districts. So it sounds like Stephanie okay, will need to do one yes, for you. Yes, so it's, mm -hmm. exactly. Thank you. Perfect. Okay, well, I'm going to move on to the end of the presentation. We still have time at the end to ask additional questions. Again, you're more than welcome to type in the chat box if you have something specific to mentorship, um, I can let Vanessa take the lead on those and I can circle back at the end. But um, just moving forward, if I can get this to cooperate, we clearly have a lot of 
different delays on our technology today. So I'm going to give it a second so I don't inadvertently move it forward too fast. Let's see here. It's not moving. There we go. Let me see if that worked. I would do it from memory, but my memory is not that great. So <laughs> you have to wait. There it comes. All right. So um, let me see here just a second. There it comes. See how slow that is, at least on my end. All right. So some updates to make y'all aware of. Um, Sophia went through the authority to transfer process that's released in the new guidelines, but what I'd like to share with y'all is the current authority to transfer. So this is a reminder that for any schools that want to transfer money between programs, the deadline for the 2021 award year is coming up on July 1st of 2021. So um, similar to last year when COVID hit, there was an exception made for the work-study program. So you'll notice on the slide that it says that Work-study programs can transfer up to 100% of their money into one of your state grant programs, depending on which one you participate in. So again, that is an exception that was made for this year only and then last year. So that won't be for the upcoming guidelines that we presented on, but for right now, since you're wrapping up this award year, I wanted to make sure that you were aware of that um, exception. So up to 100% for work-study transferring into a grant program. Now, if you have grant funds um, that you want to transfer into a work study program, the rule, the, the standard rule still applies. It's 10% up to 10% or $20,000, whichever is less. Um, and then if you were to transfer between programs, as Sophia explained, there is a rule now that allows you to transfer between work study programs up to 25%. Um, the process, again, is initiated by the school reaching out to the coordinating board. Once we receive your request on what type of funding you're trying to move, then what we do is we work with you one-on-one -on -one to generate an approval and get those funds forwarded over to the, the new program. So again, it does take time. And because we're already approaching the summer, just wanted to make sure that people were aware of that request process. Okay, so. Um, the 2021 allocations, you know, we get questions all the time, you know, when are we going to know about our allocations? And since this is a legislative session year, um, there are those pieces that we have to work with um, budget wise and calculation wise. So we are anticipating getting out a 10 day preliminary review of the data that should be coming in the next few weeks to the next month. But as far as final allocation goes, we can't release that until the governor signs the General Appropriations Act. And so that typically doesn't happen until June. So want to make sure that schools know that you at a at the earliest, you're not going to get the final allocation totals until um, summertime. And again, most schools typically will start packaging based on, um, you know, just forecasted amounts that they've come up with. This is no different than any other legislative year, but just wanted to give you all a quick update on that. The third item on the screen there is the 2021 Good Neighbor Program. So on May 6th, so that was last week, we sent out the selected students to the institutions that submitted applications. So all of the reporting officials should have received an email indicating which students got selected for the year. Um, those students can be awarded for a 12-month period starting in the fall. If your student didn't come up on the list, that means they weren't selected. <laughs> so I've gotten some confusion in the past on, on that process, but we tried to make it clear this year. So if you um, do not work with the Good Neighbor Program, it's, it's typically in the international office please make sure that you touch base with your international office just to confirm they got it. There's always a disconnect every year on that because of the, the two offices. So, um, and let's see, training. So next month, the webcast is typically on the second Tuesday of the month, but next, next month in June, it'll be on the third Tuesday, which is June 15th, 2021. Additional information will be sent out through our notification system to let you know what the topics are gonna be. And then we also post that on our student financial aid programs website under the Stay Connected page. So more to come on that. I don't have the topics uh, as of yet. Um, the deadline reminders that are on the screen, all of these are technically past due. So I wanted to make sure to 
um, bring them up so that if you are one of the schools that has one of these items that you can make sure to touch base with the folks that need to submit it. So the first one is the TET engagement report. That's an annual uh, compliance audit report that's done. And the deadline for that was April 15th. So we're still waiting on some of the schools to retur uh, return the reports to us. Um, if you have questions on that, you can actually email Deshay Reed directly. Um, net price calculator, the deadline for that was April 16th, 2021. And we have just a few schools left. I even saw some coming through earlier today. So uh, we're close to the finish line on net price calculator. But if you're an institution that requires data to be submitted to the coordinating board, um, again, that deadline has passed. So if you need assistance, we have folks that can walk you through the process, go through the instructions, and help you with anything that's challenging you to get that in. Again, the, um, the concern is that you know the information is not out there for students who are trying to um, determine how much it is to go to school. So for the state and the institution to be in compliance, we need that net price calculator information. Okay, so the last one there, financial aid database cycle, uh, cycle one for FADS. The deadline was April 23rd, 2021, and, and we have a few schools that need to still validate. Um, again, we know that there are challenges with uh, collecting data. We've got turnover at different institutions, but if there's anything we can do to support you or help you through anything, then please reach out and we'll assist you. We do have multiple outreach going on, um, outreach initiatives, I should say, trying to get all these things in, but um, if you know that you need some assistance, feel free to reach out. I don't have a slide this month on this because I didn't want to risk going over on time, but as a reminder, anytime you have a question or need assistance, the best way to contact us is through our contact us link. It's included in all of our memos. It's included on our website. Um, pretty much anything associated with the coordinating board, there is a contact us link. When you click on that link, if it's coming to financial aid services, you'll want to make sure to designate financial aid question. If you have questions for Vanessa, then you'll need to email her directly. Um, again, you can do that through the new portal. You can do that if you have her contact information. It's also most likely on our website and various um, points within, I think it's in the program guidelines on the last page. So there's different outlets in which you can reach Vanessa. Um, I think that that is it. Let me double check to see if we have any more questions that have come through. Um, it looks like Laura is on the phone, or not on the phone, <laughs> on the chat. She's fielding some of the questions. She is on our team. So thank you, Laura, for doing that. Um, let me see if I can check on any of these. Vanessa or Sophia, if y'all can unmute. And if there's any questions that you want me to clarify, again, I haven't been keeping my eye on the chat on this one. Let's see. I see one that says, let's check with Leah what she's done. <laughs> <laughs> that was the, um, I think Laura was able to answer that question pertaining okay. to access to this PowerPoint. Perfect. Yeah. So, yeah, um, once we're done with the webcast, we will be creating a link. We'll put it on our Stay Connected page, and then I typically send out a notice letting you know when it's available. It usually takes about a week to get it online. So um, we'll have that available shortly. I think I saw another question about allocations and Good Neighbor. Uh, yes. OK, so let me, I don't have the PowerPoint up anymore, but that's OK. So Stephanie Martin, it says, is that really 2021 allocations or 2022? So to clarify, they should all have been 2122. I apologize if there was a mistake on the slide. I don't have it up anymore. But um, the authority to transfer was for 2021. So that was to announce that for this current award year, uh, the deadline is coming up for that process. For allocations and good neighbor, those are for the upcoming award year for 2122. I hope that's answering your question, but if not, feel free to send a revision um, under the chat box. Let's see. There is a question down from Lone Star, Vanessa. What is the deadline to return unused fund for mentorship work study? Um, so it depends how you will be, if it's 
how you will be approaching. If you will be transferring the funds, then you'll want to follow the transfer date, which I believe, Leah, is the July um, 1st date coming up this summer. If you are not going to be using that avenue, then you will want to just return it to us no later than October, please. And that is in an effort to allow you an opportunity to um, see how you end up by August since the program technically ends at that point in time. Now, if you know now that you have funds that need to be returned and you're not transferring, you are always welcome to um, send them now if you like. Perfect. Thanks, Vanessa. Okay. I don't think there's any others. Uh, it looks like oh, I had all sorts of people fielding questions today. So thank you, everyone who's on and typing <laughs> responses. Uh, okay. So we are towards the end here. I'm going to give people one more minute to type in a question. Otherwise, feel free again to reach out directly. Sometimes it's easier to uh, contact us one-on-one -on -one since things are, are typically institution specific or area specific. So um, you can reach out to financial aid services, like I said, through contact us. You can contact Vanessa directly. But um, we, we really appreciate y'all's time today. We know that everyone is incredibly busy and that the virtual world is a very unpredictable and mysterious place. So we thank you again for the patience on today's webcast. The ladies did wonderfully. And we will be back next month with some fun new topics. So thank you again, everyone, and thank have a you. wonderful week. Thank you. Thanks, Sophia. Thank Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Vanessa. Thank You're you. Welcome. Thank you, everybody. Bye. -bye. Bye.